Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us for today's Introducing New Talent session at DevOx. It's really exciting to see you all here and I'm very excited. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Abby. I work for RecWorks um, with, and with a number of the aspiring speakers community, which is where our speakers today have come from. Um, RecWorks are a tech recruitment company, but with a huge difference. Um, obviously, we're always on the lookout for more clients, and some of our best clients have come from community members who recommended RecWorks to their talent teams. So if you're hiring or you're looking or you're working for a company that is, we would love to have a chat with you. Just come find me at the LJC booth, uh, and I'll be able to put you in touch. So what's the difference, I hear you ask? Well... Also, we really do believe that recruitment can be a force for good in the industry beyond just placing people in jobs. And we have a particular focus on learning, mentoring and personal development. And that is where all of our communities and events side of things come into play. Um, if people want to learn and others want to teach or share their knowledge, then we're more than happy to connect you through our communities and events. And like I say, this morning, speakers have all come through our aspiring speakers uh, programs so they've come through our workshops and they're now here speaking to you this morning, which is really, really exciting. And if you want to know more about any of the communities we run, uh, we run about 20 different communities um, across the tech space. So if you want to know any more about that, again, come find me at the LJC booth and I'd love to have a chat with you. But our first speaker today is uh, Edirin. He has come through our Aspiring Speakers program, as I say, and I will... Let, let him tell you the rest about himself. Go for it, Edirin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Awesome. Okay. Before I do any talk, as Abid would know, I always say this, and I invite the audience to say this with me, because I genuinely believe every day I wake up, this is going to happen. All right, so if you want to say this with me, please feel free on the count of three and we say it together, okay? One, two, three. I am going to make a difference today. Thank you. A round of applause for yourselves, please. Awesome. So I've got a question for you, and this is the question. If your work skills and titles, if you have more than one, if it's taken from you right now, what would be left? I'd like you to think about that for a little bit um, whilst I take you on a journey. So this was me. No confidence. No influence at work. Frustrated like many people are, if I dare say. No awareness. I just turn up at work. I'm not really influential in anything. I don't know what's going on, but I just show up, do testing, and go back. And that was pretty frustrating. All right? So I went from being that guy to getting a review like this. This review was from a CEO that I worked with. I got into this place as a tester, but I ended up joining the board because... I found what I'm going to share with you today. All right? So let me take you on this journey. Are you ready? Good. Let's go. So how many of us know the Maslow laws of existence? Or, yeah? Good. You know it? Right. So everything else from the first, I have it. But I was lacking in that department. Self-actualization. What does that mean? The desire to be the most that one can be. I don't know how many of us sitting in this room today is at this point, right? But I was there, and I knew something had to change. I got to work. There was no meaning to my showing up. It was same old, same old. Your colleagues will ask you, how are you today? We're like, yeah, not too bad, you know? Just, yeah, that's, that's me, you know? <laughs> so one thing that really irked me, that frustrated me, was at work I felt tolerated, not wanted, not needed. If you've ever felt that way before, you know it's not nice. I, I didn't have any impact. 
So everything about me can be summed up from the code I write on my laptop and push to whatever source control the company uses. And that was the end of my impact. But I wanted more. I know I can be more. And I really was desperate to be more. So that led me on a journey. Like everybody else, I was thinking, if I just do one more thing, one more skill, one more conference, one more book, speak well, be articulate, then everything will be different. But guess what? I did all that. It wasn't different. Maybe someone is here today doing the same thing. You know, you're taking all the Udemy courses and everything that's available because why? You want to optimize on your skills. But I'm going to show you today that optimizing on your skills alone is not enough. Okay. I went on the journey to search. I read books, articles, blogs, podcasts. I read all of them, listened to them. Why? I was desperate. I was searching for meaning. I was searching for purpose. I prayed to God. <laughs> I'm tired. I just want to make impact. I want to be relevant. I want to be useful, first of all, to myself. So in my search, this happened. These three books was very pivotal to the change that followed afterwards. Start with why. It was fundamental, helping me understand my why. What is it about me? Why do I want to do the things I want to do? Why am I desperate to do these things? And then moving on to mindset, that taught me about the fix and the growth mindset, where I don't think about myself in a terminal state that, you know, if I can just add one more skill, but I started to think about myself in multiple dimensions, that if I can reach out to this part of me, you know, then I can make that difference. And not... This is um, about an airline in America called the Southwest Airline. What this book taught me was to embrace my uniqueness, was to be confident in my difference. Okay, so these three things together led me to the discovery of what I call a personal significance. Because why? This was a time for change for me. These books led me on a journey of self-awareness. I started, I was intentional communicating with myself. What is it about me? Right, And I brought out the word personal signif significance, which we see here. What does this mean? I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. It's a state of knowing the attributes that make you unique and using these attributes with a sense of purpose. Why is this important if you find your personal significance? For me, once I found this, ever since... I can go anywhere. I can be anything. I take my significance to everywhere I go. If I'm at work, I'm significant. If I'm doing sports, I'm significant. Even in church, I'm significant. Wherever I go, I'm significant because I'm aware of who I am. There's a purpose to what I'm doing. I show up at work every day happy. Okay, I wake up every day, I'm excited about who I'm becoming and not who I am. Some of you came into this hall early, you hear the music playing, because I'm always in that state of significance. Okay, and I'm hoping that by the end of today, somebody else will get to that state or start the journey of getting to that state. I know that I can go into anything in life with confidence because I know I can make a difference. My skills does not define me, my significance define me. So anywhere I go, I can fit in. That's why I said I am portable. Like wherever, take me anywhere. I've tried this in different industries, across different businesses. I am portable. I fit in nicely because I understand my significance. Give you an example. I'm in a tech conference talking about this. That is the power of significance. Okay, how does this have, what does this have to do with influence? We know Robert Chiardini. He has the six rules about influence. When you find your significance, one thing happens. The rule of scarcity happens. Because when you're in a place and you embrace your uniqueness, you're different. There's nobody else like you. So everybody wants to interact with you. That leads you to one level of influence. You go to the next level, which is commitment. When you show up to work, you're there. You're present. You're not anywhere else because you're there with a purpose. You're there to do something that makes you happy. Okay, and the company benefits, all right? And then you go to the third level, which is liking. 
people start to like you because you're consistent, you're rare, you embrace who you are, okay? And all that starts to lift your influence. Your name goes to places within the organization that normally you wouldn't have access to because you are operating in your significance. So what is the result of all this? So doing all this culminated to me getting reviews like this, okay? This was a CTO that I worked with and I went into the place as a QA, but I took over projects I was failing because they could not manage people. And hey, you know, I love doing that. This is another review. All these are on LinkedIn, by the way. You can check them out so they're not manufactured. Okay? You can see that the pattern is the same. People talk first about my skills and then go next to, to my significance. And I've succeeded in this industry. I've been contracting for years. I've never been out of contract because I understand my significance. This is a good one for me. Joined. Uh, Somebody that was working there, I became a mentor to this person. And as we speak, they are now coaches that are coaching other people. So I'm particularly uh, proud of this. Okay, so let's go back to answer the question at the beginning that I asked you, that if your work skills and titles are taken away from you, what would you have left? And I want to answer that question with my own response to this. This is my significance. Everywhere I go, I help people and processes evolve into a better version of themselves by providing them practical ways and systems to do so. I do that everywhere. Even if I just met you for five minutes, I would do this to you. So come find me afterwards <laughs> if you want this to happen to you. Okay? One thing I always say to myself, my title can change, my skills can change, but my significance is constant. So I leave you with this. Your happiness depends on you because no organization can train you beyond their need for you, but you can train yourself to meet your need. Embrace your difference. Find your significance. Use your significance. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edirin. So we're off to a flying start, as you can tell. Um, our next two speakers, we're going to have a little laptop switch over here, but our next two speakers are from our Aspiring Women Speakers Group. Uh, they've come through our course called Couch to Conference. It's like Couch to 5K, but for women to go from not speaking at all to being able to speak at a conference. So these two ladies are proof that it works, which is very exciting. And again, if you want to know more about that, I'm happy to chat to you about that. But with no further ado, we'll do our laptop swap and invite Lena up to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Can you help me with the HD on my bit? Do you want um, presenting notes? Um, yes, please. Can I just check? Is it that one? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Don't want that. <laughs> hang on. Sorry, bear with. Someone might just need your presenter notes on your phone, I'm sorry. No, no worries. Oh, let me come over. So if you weren't awake already, you might be awake now. I hadn't realised quite how bright that was. Um, so welcome um, to why you're not a 10x engineer yet. So hello, <laughs> I'm Lena Munaram. I'm a developer productivity engineer at Chainalysis. You can find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And my notes have just gone through. Um, so I'm going to start with an apology. because I'm a little bit nervous, just in case you can't tell. <laughs> so apologize, apologies if I speak too fast, if I speak unintelligibly, or if I lose my way and find, kind of lose the plot. I'll try very hard to find my place again. Um, 
But first up, I want to say thank you. So thank you for coming to support us, um, aspiring speakers, some of us who are on the stage at a conference for the first time. It's very much appreciated. It's great to see your faces. I had hoped to see a few kind of less people, but you know, this will do, this will work. <laughs> So I'm going to spend the next not quite 10 minutes talking to you about mainly me. And if you're an engineer, maybe you. Um, but realistically, hopefully, if I hope that the contents of my talk will be applicable if you're a member of a team anywhere. So why aren't you a 10x? engineer yet. So I've gone for the clickbait title, as you've seen. Um, and I'm really kind of interested as to why you think you're potentially, if you're an engineer, not a 10x engineer yet. Now, I'm going to make a guess. and I'm going to be thinking that potentially you've got a couple of things going on inside your head at the moment. One of them may well be, oh my god, are we still talking about this? Are we still talking about 10x engineers? The second one may be, well, you know, I'm not really sure what a 10x engineer is. And for me to answer those questions, I probably need to go back a little bit. So if I go back, so despite the fact that in the previous slide, I mentioned a number of my socials, if you actually check my Twitter accounts, you'll see that I'm not really, you'll find, you'll probably learn two things about me. So you'll learn that one, I play the ukulele really, really badly. Um, and two, you'll learn that I don't really tweet very much. I don't, I'm not really very active on social media. But one day last year, I was listening to a podcast um, of an interview with Kelsey Hightower. And he was talking about engineering with empathy. And I was inspired to, to tweet a direct quote from his interview. And that tweet for me, in the context of all my other tweets, was my most engaged with tweet. It blew up within the context of my tweet. And I was very tempted at one point to actually just put my phone in the freezer. Um, if you're a Joey from Friends fan, you might get that reference, maybe. Um, but really, he was talking about his personal definition of what a 10x engineer was. And that really revived the concept for me. Um, so that's why I'm really keen to talk about it today. Um, so what do I mean when I talk about a 10x engineer? So the concept of a 10x engineer dates back to a paper that was published in 1968. And it was a paper that was presenting um, data that showed that a the most top performing, the best engineers performed 10 times in 1968, performed 10 times as well as the worst engineers. But for me, the most relevant quote, or the most relevant reference, I've just lost my notes, is this tweet up here by Sheikhar Karani. And so he tweeted that in 2019. And you can read for yourselves, but paraphrasing, he said that 10, 10x engineers, if you can find them, increase the odds of your startup success significantly. He then went on in that tweet to list a number of attributes that he felt that 10x engineers, in his opinion, demonstrated. And these are a number of them. So... 10x engineers, according to Sheikh Al Karani, um, don't like meetings. If they attend at all, they turn up late. Um, they work when they want, sometimes in the middle of the night, generally in antisocial hours, um, definitely not when there are other engineers around. They enjoy, oh, sorry, I'm standing right behind in front of the slides. Um, they enjoy experimenting with the latest technology. They will be the ones that will be picking something up, learning how to use it, probably taking it apart well before the rest of the engineering community have come on board. They prefer to do the task and don't really like to teach. They see teaching as a waste of time. And that really kind of makes them poor mentors. Um, and also, they know every single line of code in the production code base. 
Um, he also listed a number of other things, such as they always have a black screen background. They're all generally full stack engineers, but they don't do any UI. And they do all of this powered by caffeinated drinks. <laughs> so you can see it's a little bit dated. <laughs> so I think that we could probably agree that not all of those characteristics are desirable. And in fact, some of them can be quite toxic and destructive to a team. And so really, throughout my career, I've always been thinking about, you know, how can I be a better engineer? How can I, what are the qualities of a desirable engineer? And really listening to Kelsey Hightower and listening to that particular quote that I tweeted really kind of crystallized it for me and encapsulated, I think, what I was feeling. And so he said, I don't know if you can read that, but he said that a 10x engineer is the type of person who can come in and make 10 other people better than they were. So not necessarily exhibit all the traits that we discussed, but actually come in and be a real multiplier. Um, and if you remember, at the beginning of this talk, I said that this talk was going to be about me. Um, I think I did. <laughs> or certainly, or maybe about you. And I don't for one minute think that I'm a 10x engineer. Um, certainly, I don't meet um, Shekhar Karani's definition. But I do know the type of engineer that I want to work with, the type of engineers that I want to be in a team with. And I think if you're engineers here or if you're a member of a team, you know what kind of colleagues you want to work with. And for me, I think the type of engineers that I want to work with are engineers that think beyond, that think beyond their task, that think beyond themselves. I want to work with engineers that enjoy collaborating, that enjoy being in a team with me and working as a team. And it's a real personal one. I love working with engineers that document. Um, so thinking beyond, for me, that implies empathy and consideration. Um, so thinking about the other members of a team, if I'm picking up a task or I'm defining a task, how can I do that so it's accessible to as many members of the team as possible? So a great example of that is me. I'm not, so I work on a platform team, but ironically, I'm not particularly great with AWS. But I have a colleague who constantly looks out for tasks that he thinks could be great building blocks for me, and he pulls them out and highlights them. And so that effectively helps me level up and helps the team level up. Oh, we're gone again. Helps the team level up. And then looking at teamwork, it all fits in. So how do we break down a task? How do I, if I've got specific skills in a particular area, how do I spread those skills, cross skill, and bring the team up with me. And again, documentation, I love engineers that whether they like it or not, whether they love doing it, they document. Information written down is a great democratizer. It helps me, um, so it helps me build, it helps me troubleshoot, helps me debug, all without having to go to a single source a single person for information and creating those bottlenecks. So, going back to my question, so why aren't you a 10x engineer yet? The reality is you may well be a great engineer, you may well be a 10x engineer in the classic definition, but I think that we can all be more. I think that by empowering your colleagues and your team, sharing your knowledge and looking out for growth opportunities, not just for you, but for your team and people that you work with can help us all be multipliers on a different scale. So I'm going to leave you with my quickly written slogan, which is let's not be 10x, let's just be more x. And that's me. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, our next speaker today is the lovely Maddie. And again, she's come through our Couch to Conference um, speakers workshop. So we're very excited again to hear from Maddie. Over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Maddie and I am an Agile coach. And the uh, title that I wanted to talk to you about today is a approach that I call the ruthless elimination of process. And the title takes its name from a book that was really influential in my personal life called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And both the book about hurry and this talk about process have simplicity at their core. So the next 10 minutes is really for anyone who wants to bring a bit of simplicity into their work life. I've been in the Agile space for about three and a half years now. And when I first came across the Agile principles, one really stood out to me. And it was about this concept of simplicity. And what it says is that maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. And it stood out to me because it was a challenge, both on a personal level and on a work level. I'm someone who likes to try to learn a lot, prepare a lot, do a lot, but often in a way that doesn't necessarily mirror simplicity. And on the work side of things, I've been part of cultures that kind of favor being busy for busy sake and offices that have cultures of FaceTime. And so I really wanted to start enacting this challenge and bringing it to life as I started working with teams as a coach. And what we were really being asked to do was to try and maximize value over time. And a key way to do that is to try and identify uh, areas of your life or work that might be having low or little value and try to ruthlessly eliminate those. But then we all have great ideas and then there's reality. And as I started to get into the role, I really loved the continuous improvement aspect. But it was often in a more is more type way. I was lucky, lucky enough to be working with a brilliant team who were also relentlessly focused on improvement. And every retro and every week, we'd have more practices and ideas to try. But it became apparent that our processes might be weighing us down rather than enabling us. And it began to feel a little bit like this. We had a problem that we were trying to show that we were taking things to the next level and growing as a team, but we'd actually started to hinder ourselves rather than uh, take ourselves forward um, in a way that was really enabling and facilitating what we wanted to achieve. And we identified the problem was that we hadn't built up this muscle, and this muscle was the muscle of true experimentation. And what I mean by that is that we hadn't built up the practice of collectively closing learning loops and coming to collective conclusions about new ideas and whether they worked for us or they didn't. And we hadn't reflected on established and entrenched practices and really made judgments about whether they were actually adding value for us. And so what we did was something that you might do in your personal life if um, you find yourself in a position where you've got a lot of clutter. And that is the concept of spring cleaning. And this mirrors a lot of the techniques that you might see in the product management space. So what we did was we collectively created a spring cleaning ideas backlog. So everyone in the team got together and said, what exactly could we potentially eliminate? What's kind of low value, no value? And let's discuss these and potentially bin them. We voted on the highest priority ones and took each in turn to discuss and then we vo voted on one of the following options. Do we keep it as it is, adjust and upgrade, or clean it out, AKA bin it? And going into this session, I felt a little bit apprehensive. I'm not gonna lie. I felt that the team might come to judgments and conclusions on things that I facilitated, and it might be a damning condemnation on my effectiveness as a coach. I put lots of time and energy into trying to bring new ideas to life and take things to the next level. And how would it feel to turn around and say, actually, those things don't work? But what surprised me was actually, instead of feeling a sense of failure when we decided to put things to one side, I actually felt a feeling of liberation. And this kind of mirrors the feelings that we often get when we're spring cleaning our wardrobes in our personal life. So before going into something like this, you might have narratives in your head such as, oh, 
remember that dress that I wore three years ago on holiday? Wouldn't it be so great just to kind of keep that with me and see if it comes in handy in the future? And this pair of jeans I haven't worn in over a year, but maybe they'd be practical to use in the next six months. We have all of these stories as to why we should be holding on to things. And we often um, project a lot of kind of personal significance onto these attributes um, and objects that we once saw value in. However, if we're able to get through this process and kind of get through something called the loss aversion bias, where we tend to overemphasize the impact of losing something in our minds, I really believe that freedom is on the other side. Either free freedom in terms of physical space, so we can bring uh, into our lives and physical space new things that better serve us and reflect who we are, but also... Um, mental space to bring in practices and new ways of working in our work sphere um, to elevate our teams and our personal experiences. So despite thinking I was really going to hate this, I actually really enjoyed it. And I started to ask myself, what else can we bin? We firstly got rid of some metrics we were collecting that weren't really valuable, some boards, some groups that were just kind of creating noise. But I wanted to kind of really look into entrenched practices and making sure we were taking this ruthless elimination approach to all, all areas of our work lives. And not only that, I didn't want it to be ad hoc. I wanted it to be systemized. So we were taking this approach continuously. So we started to create an approach that looked a little bit like this. First, we got really specific about the suggested improvement that we wanted to bring to life. Um, anything on top of, say, a Scrum framework or a Kanban system or foundational set of agile practices that we thought might improve things. And then we got really specific about why, what do we think that was going to achieve. Then we turned to dates. So when did we agree this, whether that was a retro or discussion? When did we want to start it? And when did we want to end it? And therefore fixing the length of the experiment. And then this is the bit that we weren't doing prior. What is our conclusion after the experiment? Do we want to keep it, adjust it or bin it? And what did we learn in the process? And the learning part is especially significant when you're looking to bin things. So yes, you do invest time and energy into trying something new, and perhaps you aren't going to continue it. But the real value is in what you learn in that process. What unknowns became knowns. Um, what did you discover about yourselves and the teams and the way you like to work? And you can use that information to build um, continuous improvement in the future. And so once I started kind of getting into the swing of this, um, I began to develop some real favorites in terms of things that I love to see the back of and put in the bin. So my first couple of things are, thing, are kind of practices that are often quite entrenched in the agile space, so story points and burn downs. I absolutely love to see the back of those, and often that creates space for new and better practices to emerge. And then there's things that might not be so specific to uh, agile ways of working. So one-way async over communication with stakeholders and low-value recurring meetings can be relevant in any kind of work context. And sometimes we're looking at reducing frequency and other times we just don't need to do these things after kind of engaging with stakeholders and understanding their needs. But this is the part of the talk that becomes less about me and more about you. This is about my world, but what about yours? My challenge is, in your world, what would you like to bin? You will be the experts in terms of where in your work life the ratio of time and energy invested is not proportionate to the value gained. And I hope this is a pertinent challenge as we're coming to the final day of the conference. You've probably heard a lot of great ideas and practices that you want to bring in, but that might kind of add additional work and energy if you're not also at the same time getting rid of things that don't work. And I really believe that this art of binning is something that we need to build up the muscle of so we get closer to this uh, principle of simplicity and therefore agility. So in doing this, we're creating space for better things things that serve us more, things that elevate us and our teams. And I'd like to leave you with a takeaway that in the world of continuous improvement, we also need to be continuously binning and we will all be better served by workplaces that allow us to do that. And thank you. That is everything for me. Well done, Maddie. Thank you so much.
And our final speaker for this morning is Fahad. Again, he's come through our aspiring speakers um, workshops and um, I hope you don't mind me saying Fahad, but you had a bit of a deal with my colleague Jade, didn't you? That he said, okay, I want to start public speaking. I don't know where to start, I'm not sure. And Jade said, great, I'm gonna get you through the aspiring speakers workshop. And now here he is speaking at DevOps. So it's really exciting to, to see that just from a personal goal that you're here. So, Fahad, over to you. Hey. Uh, thanks everybody for coming to support us. Um, so, what I wanted to talk about, first of all, brilliant talk uh, by Vimadi, it's just a nice intro to my next step, which is to get into test-first development. You know, we've got a bunch of developers here, hopefully, you know, as well. So what I really want to talk about is something that's very close to my heart, which is writing tests first. And I just want to put my view on why that matters. Uh, hang on. This one. All right. Uh, just a quick intro about myself. Um, I'm a consultant software engineer. I've been working commercially for 15 odd years, but uh, I've been programming for much longer than that. Um, and I love to make software development easier for teams and individuals, you know, and I'm a big uh, retro console gaming nerd. I'm huge into mentorship and I'm a dad to two girls. So if you want to talk about any of those things, you can find me at the Twitter, the London Java community or my email. All right. So who's this talk for? Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to target this talk for junior developers who always wanted to get better at their craft, you know, spe especially People have heard about test driven developer, but not, never really understood why we should write tests first. Um, people and people who like to watch videos at 2.5x speed, you know. So that's uh, because you'll see why. By the way, just to, a quick um, disclaimer: junior and test driven development experience, but not necessarily age, wisdom, or life experiences. You know. All right. So a quick recap of what test first uh, driven development lifecycle looks like. So you've got to write a failing test, you make the test pass, and then you refactor, and that is crucial. Without that, you know, we're not really doing test and development, and I'll see why. Okay, so I would like to share an example of what I had to do when basically I started getting into this stuff. Uh, part of my work at Credit Suisse uh, as a you know new hire there was to write a CSV writer thing. So I want to take you on a journey of how I actually approached this task, and I will share three key les lessons of you know what I learned about test driven development and how that helped me improve my career in general. All right, so the first thing I would like to share is you know writing tests first. Oh, that's quite high actually. Writing tests first forces you to think about the user and the requirements. So what that mean by that? Well, you know. It means that you're asking questions about building and building guidelines for uh, what your code should do. You know, you're setting up your guardrails, your hypothesis. You know, it's very much a scientific method because you want to say, um, I want my code to do X. And you're thinking about it way up front and not really later you know, when you're in the implementation. So, you know, so let's uh, give you a journey of what, how that looks like. You know, so we are, we open a new text file. So what should the class be called? All right, let's call it CSV writer test. Sounds simple. Um, normally, you would actually write very small tests and build up upon it, but for the benefit of the impact of this testing, I would say, you know, it should do a test. All right, well, okay. Let's say we can want to try and see that can it write, write one CSV line? You know, just one line formatted with common separated values. So what do we do next? We don't have actually a class called CSV writer. We wrote a test first. So I guess we can create a CSV writer now. Right there, the code will stop compiling because you don't actually have a CSV writer. So what do you do next? You create that and you move on. So what inputs do I actually really need now? You know, so how is the input format going to be? You know, do I want to accept strings? Like one string, that would make any sense. Would be an array of strings, would be a list of strings, you know. All right, fine. You make a decision about this. You may have conversations. You may have had a uh, you know spec for it, but fine. You chose to use a, a list of strings. Okay, cool. Next, what do you want to call the function? You know, I mean, uh, and what would it return? Should it return a string? Okay, fine. We'll we'll go with that. Um, and as as you're doing this, as soon as you've written the right method on the right, you know, this actually is interesting. Um, just want to talk about a little bit about this because 
this is your API, you know, what is your call your method is very much what the people will be using. And you are the first user of your own class. So you can see if it's actually API even makes sense, you know, maybe you want to write it as CSV, you know, for stylistic purposes. But you know, this is the sort of thinking that starts happening right when you're writing tests. You wouldn't do that when you're doing implementation because you just forget about this. But it's quite important. And that's something that actually, you know, really kind of uh, believe benefits a lot from code read readability perspective. Um, so what does the output look like? You know, we see we define a, a hypothesis, fine. And we want to, for example, say, okay, so we've got a list of hello DevOps 2023. We expect it to be look like that. It's straightforward. You've defined what needs to be. And then, does the reality agree with our hypothesis? This is the most important part of a test. You know, I've seen tests where asserts are missing. So that's really not really testing anything, but it gives you 100% code coverage. So please do make sure you do assertions. All right, and some closing brackets. So this is a solution that I came up with, you know, to try and actually get this test running. It looks fine. I'm sure there will be few comments, but you could probably do it differently, you know, but you know, this, this works. So this, but you know, the key thing is you've got uh, to the point of writing a solution before you wrote the, uh, you know, before you actually um, you wrote, wrote the test first and then you got to the solution and that actually gives you a good idea of, you know, now you've got a guardrail. So what you can do next? It helps you improve confidence refactoring code. So very much what the Mary was saying, you know, about changing and removing code, making it better. Refactoring is hard, you know, especially refactoring other people's code, but you want to get the confidence and how do you build that confidence? Test and development. So, you know, what's the next step? As per my diagram, we want to do refactoring. So you know what? How about these Java Lambda streams? Look at that, a single liner. Beautiful, right? We've got rid of so much code. It's so much easier to understand. You know, it's simple, succinct, and it communicates the intent well. We have, and our tests still pass, which gives us the guarantee that, you know, this actually works. All right, next. What's the next thing we get, you know? Third thing I'd like to share is that it can guarantee your bug fixes. Yeah, pretty much. You can test specifically which input fails in production because you've built your tests that way, right? You make sure in inputs are there, write a test around it, and if that test passes, your implementation passes, right? So, you know, you deployed, I deployed my CSV writer. Obviously, I didn't think about those edge cases, and it failed with a null pointer exception. What do you do, you know? It actually, I have to write a test again. Now, this is the format I normally like to use in my tests because it's actually clear for somebody who's reading test code. And it's quite important to actually have code, especially test code, that actually reads well. You know, divide into separate sections. You've got the first set where you're actually setting up your, whatever you're, uh, you just set up. In my case, you know, I'm putting a bad input of a null. We can do an act, an act which basically is the actual method. And then you do some, your asserts. And what we want to do this time, again, because I'm writing tests first, what do I do? You know, I'm thinking about it now. Like, do I want to throw an exception at this point? Do I want to throw an empty string? Maybe I want to change the desk design. Maybe I want to use an optional, you know? And these conversations are happening while you're writing a test. You're not writing an implementation. This is the time to try and actually do this. And, you know, and if you changed it, your tests will guide you, you know? And pretty simple to actually implement it. Right, so that's, that was a quick whistle stop tour about why I feel that test first development matters. So I'll leave you with, try writing tests first. It may surprise you, you know, may I ask, tell you where, um, may I ask you to think about questions you may never thought of. And test first development is not equal to test after development. Thank you. Excellent, Fahad. Thank you so much. So that is all our Lightning Talk speakers for this morning. But if you would please just join me in thanking Edirin, Lena, Maddie and Fahad again for being really brave and getting up on this stage this morning. It's been great to hear from all of you.
Well done. Well done. Uh, and like I say, if you do want to chat about any of our communities or the initiatives we're running, uh, please do come and find me at the LJC booth in the community space on the exhibition floor. And I'd love to have more of a conversation. If you've got any questions for these guys, please do ask as well. They'll be more than happy to talk to you uh, in more detail about what they've shared this morning as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming and joining us.